right now on KGW News. Strike over. Where kids will be heading back to school and where there's still uncertainty. Plus, a new study finds traces of meth and fentanyl on TriMet trains and buses. You know, I don't think that we were surprised to find that. Why experts say it's not a cause for alarm. And later, a KGW investigation as a professional shoplifter shares his story. By the time they turn around or even hear the alarms, I'm, I'm already out the door. Kyle Iboshi goes inside prison walls for one criminal's take on slowing down the retail theft rampage. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this special edition. Let's get right to breaking news in a deadly police shooting in Hillsborough. This is on Southeast Duke Drive, close to the Jackson Bottom Wetlands. Hillsborough police say they were trying to arrest 39 year old Ryan Herrings. They say he ran into his home when they showed up this around 315 this afternoon. Then police say he came out armed with a gun and shot at officers. Officers say they returned fire and shot that suspect several times. He was pronounced dead at the hospital. No police officers were hurt. We'll keep following developments out of Hillsborough and update you as we learn more. To some welcome news tonight for families in the Camas School District. This afternoon, teachers there overwhelmingly voted to ratify an agreement, which means they and their students will have their first day of school tomorrow. The vote ends a strike by more than 450 members of the Camas Education Association who hit the picket lines a week ago Monday, asking for increases in pay, more support for special education and smaller class sizes. Now this agreement reduces target class sizes across most grade levels beginning next year. It raises teacher pay by 13% over the next two years and finally boosts funding per student for PE libraries and music programs over the next three years. Teachers say they are excited to see kids back in the classroom. Meanwhile, the strike continues in the Evergreen School District with no deal in sight. Teachers in Southwest Washington's largest district have been on the picket line since last Wednesday. We will keep you posted on that as the updates come in. Speaking of updates, we want to tell you about a Portland man accused of luring at least four women into his home, then sexually assaulting them. Authorities say 49 year old Konstantin Svidenko deliberately targeted women who are homeless and police say they are now worried beyond the four. There could be other victims. Blair Best with the story. Anna is new to living on Portland streets. Um, just a few months, though it didn't take her long to learn the dangers that come with it. There's such a hatred out here for specifically for targeted at women at times where there have been some women that have just been abused and just get beat up for no reason. She protects herself the only way she knows how. Um, I hide a lot. She wasn't surprised when we told her of the man Portland police arrested earlier this week, 49 year old Constantine Y. Svidenko. He's accused of repeatedly giving homeless women drugs as a way to lure them into his Northeast Portland apartment before sexually assaulting them. It reminded me of a, a guy that allowed me to come over to shower, um, but he stripped down naked and sat naked in his home while I showered. And it was like, I couldn't tell him that he couldn't be naked in his own home, but I wanted to shower. I needed to shower. She got out safe, but knows that's not always the case for some women, like those who accused Svedenko. It was hard, it's hard out here. Court documents show multiple women came forward identifying Svidenko as their abuser. Police confronted him back in June, but he denied ever being with those women. Three months later, police received more reports of Svidenko threatening women. They arrested him on Tuesday. He now faces 17 charges, including rape, kidnapping and strangulation. This is not a one off event. Um, this person is not the only one doing this. Ebony Brown runs Greater Good Northwest, a group supporting homeless people. She believes police should have done more to protect these women. Even if you're doing an investigation, you can still warn the women that are out here every day, potentially the next victim. A lot of women don't have necessarily the fight in them or they're in a fragile place. They, they can't fend off these folks. 
We asked Portland police why it took them several months and multiple victims coming forward before making an arrest. They said sexual assault cases are complex and require a great deal of meticulous work to gather enough evidence. They say advocating for victims and holding offenders accountable is their top priority. Now they also believe there may be more victims in this case and ask anyone with information to give them a call. Blair Best, KGW News. And if you or anyone you know are a sexual assault survivor, know you are not alone. Help is available anytime by calling the National Sexual Assault Hotline, that number 800-656-4673. The man accused of stabbing two black teenagers on a max train in what police call a racially motivated attack over the weekend will be held behind bars. Today, a judge approved what is known as preventative detention for Adrian Cummins. That's after the judge watched surveillance video that shows the suspect attacking two 17 year old boys. We're not showing that video here, but we learned it shows the teens walking onto the train and sitting two rows behind Cummins. Within minutes, Cummins prosecutors allege gets up and stabs them. Mr. Cummins, it looks like no reason, turns his head twice, looks at them, Runs up on them quickly, stabs one in the chest near the heart where he has to have open heart surgery, and then slashes another one with the knife that he's carrying around. And both teens are expected to recover. Defense did not appear to dispute the details of the attack, but said Cummins is homeless and severely addicted to drugs and was high at the time. The second video here shown in court shows a robbery Cummins is accused of committing just after that stabbing. Police say he threatened a clerk with a knife at a convenience store on Southeast Flavelle and 92nd before they arrested him. Now in court, Cummins looked down and shook his head multiple times while watching those videos. A day after Portland City Council voted to ban open air drug use, albeit pending action by state lawmakers, we have details from a new study about drug use on public transit, more specifically what researchers found when they took samples on max trains. Ashley Grams looks into whether what they uncovered could be dangerous for riders. It's common in downtown Portland, clouds of smoke, tin foil, illegal drugs, and it's no surprise that drug use spills onto TriMet Max trains. I don't think it's a surprise to anybody that lives in Portland that there's there's drug use in the area. TriMet participated in a University of Washington study focused on finding drug residue on the trains. This is new, um, trying to understand what secondhand uh, drug use smoke will do to uh, riders, employees. Researchers took over 40 samples in the metro area, some from the air and others from surfaces on board. Every sample tested positive for meth, some tested positive for fentanyl, and some cocaine. The amount of the drugs were extremely small. So how much fentanyl would actually be on your fingerprint if you were to touch a contaminated area of the train? Well, a doctor from the Oregon Poison Center says it's a really small amount, 20 million times smaller than a grain of sugar. The quantity of the drugs found are really, really small and uh, too small to be a risk for riders and employees. But TriMet's chief safety officer says they don't want any drugs on their trains, even if they don't pose an immediate safety risk to riders. We've doubled our safety and security presence since last year. Um, we've more than doubled our budget that we spend on safety and security at TriMet since 2020. But Wilson says they can't solve the pervasive drug problem alone. We really do need state and regional help to get after what is a, a real public health crisis related to drug uh, open consumption in Portland. Reporting in downtown Portland, I'm Ashley Grams, KGW News. Interesting study there. All right, an update on a story we have been watching very closely. Oregon's largest homeless shelter will now remain open after it got a new financial lifeline. This afternoon, Multnomah County Commissioners approved an emergency $1.5 million grant for the Bybee Lakes Hope Center. It is operated by the organization Helping Hands, which says it was running out of money. The grant will keep Bybee Lakes and its 175 beds open through the end of this year. Commissioners say this could lay the groundwork for a long-term relationship between the county and the center. Fire investigators in Portland are looking into three fires that started this morning, all within an hour, all of them in places where people were camping, including an RV that was destroyed. Let's show you that RV at Northeast 16th and Cooch. The fire there around 7 this morning. Officials say the second blaze involved a tent 
That one at Southwest 3rd and Oak. And then in North Portland, a fire sparked in a debris pile outside an RV. We talked to one person who also lives in an RV who says he knows the owner of the one that burnt. Um, hopefully it's not somebody going out attacking people that would be burning like burning them down. Um, it's pretty scary itself, you know, because there's a lot of people that have um, resentment towards homeless people. So hopefully it's not anything violent like that. So all right now there is no evidence the fires are connected, but investigators say they are considering that possibility as they work to determine the cause. Three former executives of Equitas, a failed Lake Oswego investment firm accused by security regulators of running in a quote Ponzi like fashion are going to federal prison for their role in one of Oregon's largest investor fraud cases. Equitas essentially imploded in 2016, leading to a years long federal investigation that went to trial and ended this May with convictions. Now, according to our partners at the Portland Business Journal today, former chief executive Robert Jesnick received a 14 year sentence. Former chief compliance officer Andrew McRitchie got just under six years and former EVP Brian Rice was sentenced to just over three years. They were also ordered to forfeit a combined total of more than $2 million that were earned fraudulently. All are scheduled to report to prison in November. You're watching KGW News and coming up, we head behind bars for a tell all from a serial shoplifter. By that time, I already got the stuff in my car and why they're trying to pull up the phone. I'm, I'm out of the parking lot. A KGW investigation featuring a convicted criminal paying the price on what does and doesn't deter thieves. I'm Matt Safino. We started out cloudy, ended up with a lot of clear sky. Nice and warm out there right now, 69 degrees. Tracking thunderstorms in northeast Oregon. Also tracking major Hurricane Lee. Unbelievable strength and development on that. And a little bit of morning fog, but a great second to last weekend of fall of summer on the way.